certainly, yeah, um, the, the, the abstraction level uh, is going to go up a few miles. So, uh, but I certainly wanted to, you know, wear the GTAC uh, speakers because, uh, as Esteban kind of pointed out yesterday, uh, and, and rightly so, that uh, I'm very proud to be wearing that. But also, probably shouldn't show my, my what I'm wearing, but this is a uh, Firefox T-shirt, and I'm equally proud to be wearing that. So, I, I think they fit together, and they certainly wear together. Um, I want to thank you for. Uh, voting for this talk. It's crowdsourcing at its best, right? Uh, uh, it's been a great learning experience preparing for this talk. Um, I haven't been at Mozilla that long, and just to discover um, where Mozilla is, what type of company it is, uh, its history, uh, and, uh, and, and where the um, user tester community actually fits into the development process. So, uh, about the uh, talk today. I'd like to give a, a little background and scale of Mozilla uh, crowdsourcing, just where that fits in in, in terms of our testing. Uh, the history of Mozilla community testing, I think it's uh, uh, really interesting to uh, goes hand in hand with the, uh, the history of Mozilla itself. And just how do we succeed with community testing? Well, you've already got some uh, uh, you know, background on me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff for the shout out about Agitar. That was certainly a lot of fun. Uh, I think one ex Agitarian has issues that he's still working out. So, um, but uh, I, I've, I've certainly gotten over it. But, uh, but I've been in the testing biz for, for most of my career. Uh, certainly at, at uh, various test management positions um, at these companies. Some have different names now, but. Uh, I find myself now as the uh, QA director at Mozilla. Um, been there about nine months. I started there uh, January of this year. I manage a team of 30 global test engineers, and it's truly a global uh, uh, team. A um, number of my folks are spread all over Europe. Um, I have a few in Canada on each coast, uh, a couple contractors uh, working for us in India, and the rest in um, uh, Mountain View, California is where uh, uh, Mozilla is. And this is kind of a new challenge for me for having such a remote team. Uh, I don't normally necessarily plug uh, uh, software, but I live on Skype now. So, uh, but it's uh, been so far just a great, uh, great experience. So I wanted to give you a little background on uh, Mozilla Foundation because it, it gets asked a lot about um, is it a uh, nonprofit? Is it a profit? Well, I indicated I work um, at Mozilla Corporation. Uh, Mozilla Corporation is a for profit company. We do um, generate revenue, um, but uh, uh, both Mozilla Messaging and Mozilla Corporation are wholly owned subsidiaries of the Mozilla Foundation, and the Mozilla Foundation is a nonprofit. Um, as you see there, that uh, Mozilla Messaging handles the Thunderbird email client um, in terms of the development. And of course, Mozilla Corporation is concentrated on the desktop Firefox. Uh, you see the code name Fennec, but that is uh, desktop on mobile platforms. Uh, in addition, that we also manage Mozilla Labs. And Mozilla Labs is uh, essentially an incubator of, of research projects and te technologies. Uh, one of the uh, probably the uh, uh, premier one that, that, we, that we've been working on so far that's going to be in Firefox 4 uh, is called Firefox Sync, and it uh, allows syncing in the cloud uh, user uh, bookmarks and uh, tabs and user preferences so that each instance of Firefox uh, is, is automatically synchronizing that data. Um, Mozilla really is a global open source project. Uh, it, it's, it, represents a community of thousands of creators. And it's both a public benefit company as well as a mission-oriented company. And as you see here, uh, this is our mission. It is to promote openness, innovation, and opportunity on the web. And that's really a full stop. Um, that's really what we do. Um, and that's what um, you know, from, uh, the CEO on down you know, really drives that message. And more specifically, we want uh, 
people to engage and participate and innovate um, on the, uh, to make the web essentially better for everyone. We use a, like a community-based approach to engage folks of really any, any, any uh, uh, experience level to advance the technology of Mozilla open source projects, um, such as Firefox. You know, for example, um, just recently, um, there was this dedicated 12-year-old, his name is Alex Miller, who uh, actually discovered a, a critical buffer overflow in the browser and got awarded a bug uh, bounty of like $3,000. So it's just like anybody can join and, and, uh, uh, and, and participate. So um, another aspect, uh, I'm still getting my used to, you know, the scale of Mozilla. There's just tons of information that flows fast and furious, you know, on a daily basis, hourly basis. And, and really about the huge numbers of, of users of Firefox. It's, uh, it, it is it's kind of daunting and exhilarating, um, you know, to know that you're actually working on a product that one in 12 people on the planet actually use. So when you first uh, start at uh, Mozilla, you get this kind of chuckled, grinned, and said, hey, you're going to get hooked up to the Mozilla Firehose. And I have to say, it's, it's very aptly named. There is so many sources of information that change, you know, just uh, like I said, on a, like an hourly basis. And it's up to each person to really uh, judge for themselves what they monitor um, on a daily basis or hourly basis. And it, it's a struggle. People that have been there for years still, you know, um, are constantly uh, challenged by, you know, this uh, amount of information that uh, changes. Uh, Mozilla scale. If you see that um, we have about 400 million users, depending on how you count these days, uh, but every day, like 10 to 15,000 people uh, in our, what we call nightly testers, download the latest uh, trunk version and, and do nightly testing. Our beta testers, um, they scale up in, in, in the millions, and uh, uh, we're targeting like two, uh, two and a half million people, or, or beta testers, to work on Firefox 4. And, you know, from a QA perspective, this is pretty mind-boggling in terms of the numbers. And you really, you know, it, it just gives me pause every time that uh, there's a big patch that's uh, landing. Um, if a change uh, adversely affected just, say, one half of one percent of our users, you're still talking about two million uh, unhappy customers that uh, I don't want to see. <laughs> so, um, a little, I want to give a little story. Um, kind of a recent uh, Firefox uh, uh, product team meeting. There is uh, actually this occurred a while, uh, it was about two months after I started, and we were working on this uh, major feature for Firefox 4 called Auto Process Plugins. And essentially is, is crash protection so that any plugin that gets fired up uh, in the browser runs in its own process, and if it dies, it uh, doesn't take down the whole browser. And the, the big decision was is that uh, we were going to take this big patch and port it to the existing 3.6 version of um, uh, Firefox. And um, I certainly... Um, had pause on this, we were doing some testing on it, but uh, I really came, you know, this is kind of my mindset um, before going into to, to this meeting to uh, really discuss whether it's shipped or not shipped to our beta customers. And um, as, you know, that uh, and being in QA or testing or something like that, you know, your audience or your users, it's, it, it doesn't matter. There's, what you're trying to do is no bucks, right? Or at least, you know, testing, you find the bugs and get them fixed, um, you know, before your audience does. That or you can have that. And I, I don't want two million of these people with torches coming after my head. So, but on the other hand, the, the, the product manager, uh, his name is Mike Pelsner. He's been there about five years. And uh, he had a, certainly a different perspective. Um, he was very eager to get this new feature, you know, to the uh, beta audience as soon as, as possible, like within days. But I was uh, uh, being aggressive, and I said, no, no, we've got some more testing to do. 
And so just a little uh, discussion kind of developed in this meeting. In fact, uh, we went at it with each other for, it was like about an hour. I think we managed to empty a room with about 30 people with just, in fact, it was a teleconference, so I'm, you know, just shouting out at these speakers in the, in the, in the ceiling. Um, and uh, not exactly our most professional moment, but we finally were able to, to concede each other's point in that we were both right and wrong. Um, it was a, a big change from my perspective. Um, you know, to understand where our uh, tester community really, you know, uh, comes into play. Uh, kind of a big point is, is that our in-house QA team, I think they do a fantastic job of finding the functional bugs, and uh, you, you could call it low-hanging fruit, but uh, you know ones that uh, are on, let's say, the popular platforms. But there's certainly a diminishing return of what they can do and what they can find, because we just don't have uh, the resources for a huge compatibility uh, uh, lab, you know, with a lot of different hardware and stuff like that. So this is essentially where our tester community absolutely comes into play in terms of the. Um, uh, being able to, you know, like help us do the surface testing of the compatibility, compatibility matrix uh, that we're confronted with. So, essentially, I went from protector to respecter of, of the uh, tester community. Um, certainly as a partner of the QA team, helping us really test new features, new patches, um, always providing feedback um, on the suitability, usability, um, whether it's buggy or not, and effectively giving us uh, an overall health assessment of the, you know, the current Firefox release or that current build. So that was that meeting. Um, Mike and I work really do, uh, well together these days. Um, in fact, our biggest focus right now is getting uh, Firefox 4 shipped as soon as possible, hopefully very soon. So I wanted to turn a little bit of attention to crowdsourcing. Um, crowdsourcing has been around for quite some time. Uh, it uh, certainly, uh, you know, kind of a no-brainer involves a crowd working on a kind of a common goal um, or task. Uh, certainly not a new concept by any means. Um, crowdsourcing, as we know it today, is, is fueled by internet technologies. We're all quite aware of today's capability in terms of social networks and uh, uh, news groups and stuff like that, where virtual groups form um, almost instantly without regard to lo uh, location. And, and crowdsourcing today has certainly, it, it's grown into an industry uh, by itself. I mean, it's, uh, and these are a few of the examples of um, companies or projects that um, either utilize some aspect of crowdsourcing or it's their whole business model. Some, uh, a company not, uh, you know, very familiar with this crowd is Utest. Um, we share kind of a common bond with, with Utest because they are, uh, their secret sauce is, is, is test community management. And so we're kind of um, uh, in talks and exchanging ideas about how we can better do um, community management. So uh, it's uh, something that, that we do. Um, and another aspect about crowdsourcing, um, Kind of, uh, Mozilla Labs has this concept series, which um, are open calls to the community to participate um, uh, in a project to, to um, discover and prototype technologies and whatnot. Um, it was somewhat fortunate timing is, is that uh, we actually have uh, Mozilla Labs that um, uh, a particular project called uh, Crowdsource Crowdsourcing. Um, and it was goals are, you know, effectively to um, identify the best practices of what is crowdsourcing and identify the gaps, um, you know, that uh, exist in, in, let's say, what Mozilla does. And then finally trying to create uh, prototypes or programs that uh, Mozilla could actually adopt and better utilize um, uh, their, their use of crowdsourcing. Uh, some of the key findings is, is that, uh, not too surprising, there's uh, in crowdsourcing projects that there's, there's heavy users and casual users, kind of sometimes referred to as the 99-1 or, or rule. And if you think of, like, Wikipedia, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, used as the uh, uh, kind of epitome of, of crowdsourcing project, 
like 90% of the people that uh, uh, are the audience, they, they, they're the lurkers, they, they, they consume the data, whereas like 9% of um, the users in, in that community are like the editors, they fix you know, the, the, the entries within Wikipedia. And then there's those super users, that 1% that are like the creators. And so that's something, those users are, are something that you really want to take care of. Uh, another point is, is, uh, is crowd motivation. Uh, and that uh, is typically um, uh, separated in, in two basic forms, is kind of intrinsic motivation and extrinsic. In, intrinsic um, motivation, you can think of the uh, kind of enjoyment base, you know, like gaming communities. You know, people enjoy games and, and uh, you know, are just uh, eager to join, you know, within the group and discuss that. Or it's kind of, a, kind of an obligation community-based approach. They feel a oneness with the, you know, the group that they're in. Uh, extrin extrinsic motivation, um, very, um, you know, you, can, you think of just money, money for a particular job or a particular task. But it's also um, a, a, the ability um, to recognize achievements. And this is actually a big deal in, in, in crowdsourcing these days, is that, uh, is the recognition of status, is um, like badging systems are, are big in, in crowdsourcing um, uh, models these days, and how we can universally show or uh, 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 like things like social credibility or, or street cred. Um, kind of the last point here is crowdsourcing relies on people. I mean, it, uh, and it, you shouldn't view this as human automation. Uh, you need to, if, uh, for success, you need to give the ability, uh, of people the ability to shine and communicate and collaborate and it's got to be fun. People got to enjoy, you know, coming back again and again to the project and, uh, uh, and, and participate. So when we um, talk about uh, crowdsourcing, often community and crowd get uh, uh, interchanged. Um, and I don't think this is correct. I believe that uh, they're absolutely suited for different tasks and different problems. So you can always think that as this being somewhat of a spectrum where uh, crowd-based approach is, is, is better for like single tasks or, or parallel ta tasks. Typically, uh, uh, it, it's a competitive situation where, uh, let's say, little or no competition um, or form of, of, of cl collaboration exists. People are, are just out there to do the task. Community-based approach is, um, I, I think, better for longer lived projects. Typically, this is where the rise of expertise um, is needed, you know, to complete the goals and tasks of, of, of the project, and sometimes uh, is referred to as expert sourcing. But when we talk about crowdsourcing um, and uh, crowdsource testing at Mozilla, I think we're really referring to kind of a unique hybrid approach. Uh, we use various forms of, like, intrinsic, extrinsic uh, motivation to engage the tester community to work on any particular release, any particular patch, um, and we also get down to actively engaging the community, sometimes on a one-to-one-on-one -on -one basis to help us perform testing tasks, uh, and sometimes manual like exploratory testing, uh, regression testing, and uh, bug verification. We will also take advantage of the large number of, te of tester community and gather as much data as we possibly can, um, either through passive means or through very low barrier feedback mechanisms. And lastly, we really rely on their passion, their uh, huge enthusiasm to make Firefox a better product. And all that combined is what I refer to as crowdsource testing Mozilla style. So now we kind of want to talk a little bit about the history of the testing community. Uh, the history of the Mozilla tester community goes hand in hand with the history of Mozilla, which is uh, the history of Mozilla, you know, spans about 12 years. I mean, it, and you could do a series of talks on, you know, what transpired, you know, during the history of Mozilla. But as these three points below here are what I would consider major milestones that uh, affected the, the uh, Mozilla tester community, during the, the history of the project. Um, the first milestone was essentially the start. It was the release of the source code of the Netscape browser 
as an open source project. Um, and uh, it was administered by Mozilla.org. And it was intended to be strictly um, a source code only release. But the fact that it was a source code only release, um, it really um, meant that it was kind of a members only club. And the entry to that club um, mostly meant you were you know, a, a developer, hacker, somebody that was uh, intimately involved in, in uh, developing uh, the software. But there certainly was lots of passionate people that uh, uh, wanted to help, wanted to be involved. And um, uh, this person, Asa, um, is credited uh, uh, for being the first Mozilla community tester. Uh, he uh, really galvanized the uh, early going of the tester community, uh, which was, it, it, it was really quite rough. Uh, most of the time, it was actually chasing down builds. It was trying to find somebody that could build on this particular platform and, uh, and do some testing for that. So this is kind of the rise of the nightly build. Um, it was kind of against the rules you know, to do uh, builds, but it, it became a necessity. Uh, community members, um, uh, like I said, you know, started building the product uh, with the latest changes, and also uh, Ace and his team really started what were uh, daily tests, daily manual tests, to validate the build and, and uh, uh, communicate that out to the community. Uh, and so it had some level of, of, of uh, stability that uh, people could uh, rely on. So this was actually a, a great success. That uh, uh, the community grew into like the, the thousands. Uh, Asa was uh, well respected. It, 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 he's a, a, right now he's an evangelist. Um, uh, it's still you know at Mozilla to grow this community of testers. But uh, it certainly wasn't without its problems. Uh, as the members grew, so did the volume of the feedback uh, you know given to the development team. There was uh, it was like too much of a good thing. Uh, the feedback started to get quite noisy. Uh, it started to not always be accurate. You know, duplicate bugs started showing up. Um, and this is somewhat a problem with larger community uh, uh, crowds. And, and uh, the only way that this was really solved, it was solved in a couple of ways, was effectively was better tester uh, training of the community so that uh, they could write well-documented uh, bugs. Um, they actually, you know, to kind of stem that tide, they had introduced what is called the unconfirmed status in Bugzilla and for bugs so that, you know, if anybody produced it, if they didn't have the right privileges, um, they couldn't uh, get submitted to developers. Uh, and it took people with the right pr uh, privileges that would verify the bugs, turn them into new, and send it off to the developer. The other thing was to introduce um, what were called test days. And these were really essentially training for testers um, to, um, as, as well as doing some, some good work and, and that focus on a particular feature um, and how to write bugs and to you know, just kind of galvanize a bunch of testers around a particular task. Also there was to, to uh, do bug triage, which was a, a very big part of what uh, uh, you know, that the tester community had to, to deal with. These, uh, these practices actually live on today. We do this on a kind of a uh, regular basis, you know, uh, in, in terms of test days. Uh, the last, I mean, the second um, um, change was just, it was a huge change for Mozilla um, and the tester community. Um, I kind of call it the modern age of, of, of Mozilla. Uh, this is when uh, the Mozilla Foundation was formed. They almost it essentially became a startup uh, and no longer under the wing of AOL. So it kind of went from strictly open source project to, uh, to more product focus, and it was kind of the, the rise of the Firefox uh, code base. Um, for the tester community, this was a com complete reset. Uh, no longer did it have the support of the uh, parent company of uh, AOL. And so there was huge reliance on the testing community going forward to really um, monitor you know, the, the uh, uh, health and the uh, quality of, of the browser as, as it went forward. So the last um, point here is, and it took a while, 
Um, it was kind of in 2007. And this was the, the rise of continuous integration and unit tests. It became quite a necessity just because of the complexity of the browser uh, was becoming so huge and problems were starting to really show up without it. There was automated testing to a certain extent, but it was never coordinated. Uh, but um, a particular developer, uh, his name is Robert Sayer, some people might know him, but uh, he's kind of credited of pushing this um, through our development. Um, somewhat kicking and screaming, but uh, as, as you well know, that this is a very tough thing to do in a, in a project. And, uh, but what happens that we have today is, is just amazing. It's, it's a, the largest uh, continuous integration system that's built on BuildBot and uh, tinder, uh, Tinderbox technologies. Uh, for every commit, um, 11 full builds. In fact, I think it's even more of that because if you take into the, the uh, mobile builds, um, are, are produced for every code change. There's about 300,000 unit and performance tests uh, uh, that are get executed per build, and which is, you know, kind of yields like 3.3 million uh, automated tests, you know, executed for every committed code change. And so this, the result of continuous integration, at least on a nightly basis, is a version of the browser which we refer to as Minefield. Uh, Minefield, um, somewhat appropriately named, but it kind of uh, doesn't describe it, uh, give it justice, right? It's, a lot of people use this as their personal browser. It's that level of stability and allows our tester community to really focus on new features, new capabilities, and not worry about the uh, stability. Now, I, I can't say that it always is, is completely stable, but um, it, it really is a fairly solid uh, uh, product, you know, for every code change that gets developed. I kind of want to uh, change uh, a little bit about community feedback. Um, a lot of uh, the community feedback and, and tester feedback is, um, is exists in Bugzilla. In fact, I think um, Mozilla has at least the largest, or one of the largest, Bugzilla uh, instances uh, in existence. Everything runs on Bugzilla. I mean, if you want a new chair, you write a bug. If you want to talk to legal, you write a bug. But certainly anything that has to do with software um, is every issue, um, feature change and whatnot, is tracked in Bugzilla. And some of these bugs, um, have well over you know, hundreds and hundreds of comments uh, during its lifetime. And sometimes that lifetime you know, can uh, happen over a weekend. I've seen, you know, you can actually see uh, comments just go flying by. So a lot of communication happens on Bugzilla. Um, another uh, uh, way that it, uh, in terms of feedback, um, an unfortunate fact of life is that browsers do crash. Um, Firefox has been known to crash. Um, uh, somebody asked at a uh, recent conference that, uh, you, know, you know, should I report crash data? Do you guys even look at it? Does it go into, a, you know, some black hole or something like that? Uh, indeed, we, we do. Uh, in fact, um, every crash uh, over the last five years is on our public database. And that's one thing that uh, Mozilla does is all the data that we collect and analyze and whatnot is something that anybody can look at and view. So one of the things that, you know, the crash data, it's, um, it's processed by uh, this back-end system called Socorro, which is uh, based on BrakePad, uh, presents uh, a pretty extensive uh, uh, web app with lots of graphing capability, uh, ability to drill down to signatures to assign, assign bug reports, uh, it also gives some ability for developers to, to really identify correlations, like uh, different uh, uh, versions of plugins, for instance, or different add-ons or something like that. Because it, a lot of times these crashes are never re reproducible. Uh, at least you can't, uh, you know, get to steps to reproduce and, and go off of it. So we have to get some correlation. We have to get a lot of data to, to really figure this out. And um, one of the more important aspects of, of, of the crash system is that it's an early warning system to us. Uh, when we, you know, based on a particular patch or a particular release, 
is we may find one or two crashes in our testing in, in terms of the uh, QA, you know, internal testing. And it doesn't, you know, we certainly write a bug, but it doesn't register as, you know, something that uh, uh, is, is going to be a significant problem. It's only until you start picking up the volume. And so we look at this and monitor this data on an hourly, daily basis to see if there's any rise in, in uh, crashes that are developing. And, and if they do, uh, you know, the alarm bells go off and we certainly take a look at it and try to, to diagnose it as soon as we can. We also use uh, crash data, um, you know, for, uh, let's say, release criteria. Um, as you see um, that our Firefox releases over the last five years, up until 3.5, they were exhibiting probably the same pattern. But if you see in, in, in terms of 3.5, these are the uh, bugs that are reported that are associated with crashes. Um, we re released uh, too early. Uh, it, we weren't paying attention to this graph enough, and Mozilla got pretty hammered about this. 3.5 was, was uh, represented as a, a pretty low quality and perceived as a low quality release. This is something that we're really paying attention to, attention to now in terms of the release of, of Firefox 4. Um, Firefox 4 now has um, uh, uh, a feedback mechanism. The, uh, let's see if I can point to this. Uh, in the uh, 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 beta version of the product, you can submit like a happy face if you're happy with what's going on, or a sad face, and give some sort of like Twitter-like comment as well. If it's a site that's busted, uh, you can uh, put that in. And the um, mechanism in the back, the back end collector is a kind of a Hadoop, I think, H-based uh, implementation allows for word and phrase-based clustering so that uh, we can, uh, like if a site uh, or a particular web app, you know, starts uh, coming online, you know, we can take a look at that. Um, or if it's a particular theme, uh, like tab browsing, we see, uh, you know, if these are uh, the, the problems that uh, crop up. It's kind of noisy. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's uh, like Twitter. I mean, we also uh, monitor Twitter. But it really gives us sometimes a, a pretty good feel in QA where uh, the sensitive feature um, uh, exists so that we do more testing around that. In fact, um, around Mountain View, we have LCD screens of both uh, the feedback uh, uh, data as well as the uh, Twitter mentions on Firefox. And that's an interesting thing to look at, I mean, in terms of the uh, uh, different uh, comments. It's a, Pretty raw stuff. Um, um, one of my criteria is, is that I know you can't see it. Is, is that we, there's interspersed green and red there on the Firefox input? Is one of my criteria is I want to see that green for at least a, a good day. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a release criteria. How do we engage the the Mo Mo Mozilla tester community? Well, manual testing is. Um, still a very big part of what we do. Uh, it's one of the main activities uh, where we directly interact with our tester community. Uh, what you see here is uh, um, a web app called Litmus, uh, is a test case management tool that we've actually we've lived with uh, for like the last five years. It, it served its purpose, it's a little creaky. Uh, it was written by an intern uh, over the summer which, you know, uh, is kind of a, a stand, you know, the, the test of time. But this is something that we're uh, completely revamping right now and rebuilding uh, to, uh, I think, better support uh, kind of the crowdsourcing model as well as um, uh, it being able to um, be a lot more distributed in what we do. So this is what uh, we're doing. This is where uh, we write all our manual testing. I had mentioned uh, uh, test and bug days. We're ramping that process up quite a bit too, you know, to make that um, um, a much more enjoyable, you know, thing for our tester communities uh, as well as educational. Uh, test days are like on the day of the uh, the event. We advertise in many different forums, uh, and we use uh, uh, IRC quite a bit in terms of our communication mechanism. Um, does everybody know what IRC is used? 
Everybody not heard of IRC? Because it's, it's kind of old technology, but it's basically allows, uh, uh, it's a chat technology that where uh, you can join several different channels or rooms or something like that. And this is where we interact mostly with our tester community. And a test day, you know, is uh, usually devoted or focused on, on key features that have recently landed. Uh, we perform uh, exploratory testing, uh, regression testing, and test case development. So, and like I said, we've been making it much more of a contest. Uh, we did this recently, and it, it I think, improved our uh, participation. Um, bug days, as I mentioned uh, a little bit before, are focused on, on things like verifying um, unconfirmed bugs or verifying um, uh, bugs that have been fixed. So these are one of the main test uh, activities that we do to engage our, our tester community. And one of the things that we're working on right now is um, what I refer to as community-focused automated testing. Uh, Mosmil is a JavaScript framework um, that allows GUI testing uh, of Gecko-based uh, application. And certainly we're using that uh, uh, for testing Firefox and Thunderbird. Um, it's, it's somewhat more suited for uh, community for a number of reasons. One is it doesn't require an instrumented build. Um, and it works with any version of Firefox that you can download from the FTP site. Uh, the other um, aspect of it is, is that um, it, it's very well suited to be uh, bundled as an extension or an add-on. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is effectively bundle all of our tests in the environment and be able to distribute that to our tester community around the world. Uh, we've, we're building a back-end database, uh, which is based on Couch, uh, it's DB, to gather all that data and see you know, what uh, you know, are the results across the different, uh, 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 let's say, platforms that the community runs on. So kind of just an overview of how we succeed. Uh, like I indicated, Continuous integration is, is absolutely the foundation of our current success in, in, in uh, uh, community testing. Um, and, and also, part of that, you know, getting that set up is, is utilizing that community feedback, their uh, ability to tell us to, you know, what, um, uh, you know, is a problem for the types of testing that they do. Um, and also engaging with them on a direct basis uh, um, is, is manual testing, but uh, I think in the future, we're also looking at how they can participate in automated testing. So that's how I think we uh, 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 really succeed currently. One of the things I wanted to talk about is community stewardship. I don't think we do a great job on that. Um, we uh, do kind of a, I don't know, a, uh, I don't know if it's a bad thing or, or a thing, but as these leaders in both development and the tester community rise up and become well known to us uh, for the work that they do. Uh, what do we do? We, we hire them. Um, and so they, they essentially become you know, employees. And I, I don't think that's a, a great thing in the long run for the, uh, the health of the community. So we need to figure out how we can replace you know, these community leaders. And, and largely that's through you know, education, reaching out to uh, prospective users uh, uh, or, you know, members that would like to join our project. One of the things that uh, we're doing currently uh, within Mozilla, this is Mozilla Drumbeat, uh, is a project started this year to uh, really reach out to our uh, user community to teach uh, essentially just users about what is open web and how they can participate and various uh, web projects. Um, there's uh, web-made videos is one of the more famous ones. In fact, um, next or in a couple of weeks, November 3rd through uh, the 5th, is Drumbeat's first uh, festival uh, for learning about the open web. And this is going to take place in Barcelona, Spain. Um, what's an interest to us in, in, in QA is we're developing a curriculum about Mozilla testing um, that is going to uh, participate uh, and be in, in incorporated within uh, Drumbeat's what is called the peer-to-peer -peer university. And the peer-to-peer -peer university is this series of um, online classes that are available to anybody 
uh, that teach web development skills. But we want to be able to teach, you know, per per perspective tester communities about what it is to do testing. So teaching our community about, you know, things that we do is, is something that is going to be very uh, central to uh, uh, our plans for next year. So lastly um, um, is, is that we have um, a website. This website is uh, referred to as, as, as QMO, or equalitymozilla.org. Uh, uh, and it's certainly our main conduit uh, in communication to our tester community. Um, this is where we effectively reach out, uh, educate. Uh, there's lots of our documentation on there. Um, we just completely rewrote, rewrote uh, uh, this site in WordPress. And it was also going to be incorporating BuddyPress to uh, support membership login, uh, better over support of, of the tester community. And I certainly wanted to ramp um, or tell my team, you know, how can we get our message out? And one of the things I wanted to uh, kind of play a little bit is we, I told them, let's, let's create a video. Let's uh, create a video about what we do and stuff like that. So I wanted to play a bit with you. It's, it's a little long, but I won't play the whole thing. So See if we can get this going. There are some things you should know about Mozilla. We're an open source project. We're end user focused, and anyone can participate. Hallo, mein Name ist Carsten Burg. Ich wohne in Deutschland und arbeite seit drei Jahren im Bereich QA Services. Mit unserer Hilfe wird Firefox der stabilste Browser in diesem Sonnensystem. I work in mobile QA. Our primary goal is to make sure that your favorite free mobile browser is of the highest quality. Konnichiwa. So I think you can get the, uh, the idea that this is, uh, you know, it's a global team that we're out there trying to reach anybody out there, you know, on a global basis. So I think lastly, what I'd like to talk about is uh, effectively a call out to, uh, uh, to you and, and the, te you know, the, the test uh, 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 professionals. Uh, this has been a, a just a wonderful experience for me to really get to know some of you personally, you know, some of the projects that are happening. I guess I wanted, you know, as a, as a reminder that Firefox is an open source project uh, and it's available to anybody and it's got, uh, it, and I think it's a prime proving ground for any new innovation and or testing technology. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity uh, for, you know, collaboration uh, that we can do, you know, experiments together. So just to say that our door is always open to collaboration. So if you have any ideas that you want to bounce off of and, and see what it can be done, um, we'll certainly be able to do that. Uh, the next chapter for me is, is you know, how we can improve our uh, processes and our, uh, you know, how we, we can better make our tester community shine. And uh, so I guess I invite you all to uh, help us collaborate together and uh, see where we can use uh, let's say Firefox as a springboard for new testing tools and technology. So thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. I guess I'm ready for any questions. Hi, Matt. Hi. A great talk. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, manual testing is a large part of what your community testers are focused around, right? Now, given the size of your community, can you tell us a little bit about how you manage that? How do you communicate to your testers that this is something that I want more feedback on? And you know, when the testers come back with bugs that they report in either Litmus or Bugzilla, how is it that you uh, continue that feedback loop with them to maybe ask them for, excuse me, ask them for more questions or clarifications, etc. Is that a big problem? Um, it is. It, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, um, we do it in, in a couple of ways. Like um, in nightly testers, we have a uh, a news group that and in, in, in a newsletter that we uh, uh, we don't do it on a daily basis, but we certainly if there's a new feature or new patch that has just landed, we certainly inform them that it is now landed. Here is like our existing test plan, and see what they can do, um, and and just you know, in testing it. So, in, in the, that kind of focus. The other is um, kind of what I mentioned there is is about the test days. 
and and that's how we kind of the uh, kind of uh, can, uh, keep that communication um, get, uh, line open with our uh, community testers. That you know, if they're sometimes they're they're assigned to a particular feature, and and sometimes they're even assigned a particular feature. So um, it, largely, that that communication is through Bugzilla, but it's it's really you know it's 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 a lot of like email or uh, IRC you know uh, communicating. They come to us at like a, we have a particular QA channel uh, where we see you know these the testers come up um, largely uh, we don't know who they are uh, they they, uh, they have all these funny IRC nicknames and uh, kind of a funny funny story is is that uh, we recently did uh, this summer a summit uh, up in in uh, Whistler Canada and uh, it was great it was 300 of the uh, em employees as well as 300 of the community members. But it was just, it was interesting to go like, oh, you're, you're that person. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, just kind of the whole combination of trying to communicate with them. I don't know, does that answer your question? Uh, hey, I'm Ramesh. Hi, Ramesh. So um, a few things. I'm sure, like, you know, most of us uh, here use uh, Firefox. Uh, it's a great browser. At the same time, I think most of us use Firefox as more of a debugging tool. We use Firebug extensively, and right. like you know, uh, that's one of the great IP I think uh, we have in terms of like you know as a testing community. Um, is uh, Firefox uh, trying to add any uh, anything more to it so that one it benefits the whole testing community in terms of uh, like you know doing a better debugging, uh, as well as um, like you know, also helps in terms of debugging the code of Firefox itself. Um, absolutely. I mean, Firebug is, is, is probably one of our premier developer tools and something that we support absolutely, both in, in terms of development as well as testing. So there's, there's quite a whole program around, you know, just that particular add-on. So, uh, and we're very dedicated because we know that, um, you know, Firefox is kind of like the default browser for doing web development. And uh, if you, uh, we did a, a study recently of what our uh, beta audience or beta tester audience. It's 95% male under the age of 35. So I think, and I would say that 93% of that are probably developers, you know. So uh, that kind of skews it, but I mean, it, it, but it also, I think, brings into to an important thing is, is that Firefox, I think, is, is, is absolutely here to stay as a development browser. And, you know, part of what I was talking about, this is where I think we can innovate, you know, together in terms of tools and whatnot. Hi. How Hi. do you uh, triage and prioritize the defects, and who are the people involved, and how are they selected? The triage in, ter in terms of the bugs? Um, largely, um, uh, it's the development, um, although our QA team mem uh, members uh, do participate, not in every project, but uh, uh, it's effectively community selected in, in, in terms of the, that kind of triage. Um, but as far as like the the management of bugs and stuff like that, it's it it falls on our responsibility, you know, to make sure that the bugs are verified, uh, and and closed, you know, as as we go on. But to be honest, I, the bug database is huge, and so the prioritization becomes a a, a big task. I, you know, do we do it well? I don't know. I mean, it, it it's something that we pay attention to, but it is just a huge problem, and this is where we uh, really rely on our community, you know, to help us out and, and to give us feedback and, and how that's done. Okay. Um, you know, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't going through the bug reports and understanding them a bigger project than the, than the Mozilla itself? You know, uh, because because I, I uh, okay, try to go through, uh, you know, many of the bug reports and I see different people have a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's a bug reporting uh, style, although you have guidelines, uh, you know, given to them. You know, but I see if I were to be in that uh, position, I, I would uh, find it extremely difficult in order to go through, okay, each one of them understand. So, you know, if you could actually help us understand how is it that you're managing that, that would be fantastic. How do we manage uh, making sure that uh, there's proper documentation? Um, I, essentially, is, is that it, you know, we have examples, um, both you know what is a good report, and if we do see you know something that is out, you know that 
is not meeting that kind of standard. We pointed out, we pointed out to the community members saying, and not, you know, oh, too overtly, but telling them that, you know, this is the, the required information. And sometimes developers are less than uh, uh, di diplomatic and say, you know, butter off <laughs> and, and until you can provide me the right information. So, you know, that there's, there are standards in what we try to do, but it's largely, I think, self-policed in, in how uh, the right information gets, you know, within bug reports. Explicit means, do you, do you have any explicit means for taking the bug reports and uh, analyzing trends and using that as feedback for the developers to uh, do something like uh, process improvement? We do um, um, have some, you know, like that, and we do, uh, in terms of charts, you know, that uh, kind of the bug, you know, the, the fine fixed rate, uh, you know, the, as well as being able to do that. And that's something that's actively being developed right now in terms of the tools and uh, we haven't done a good job, I think, in the past, but I recognize that. And, you know, there, there's such a wealth of information out there that it's just a shame that we're not using it more effectively and, and targeted. But uh, that's certainly that, you know, that is on our plans in terms of development of tools. Any, uh, anybody that uh, would uh, have, again, good ideas in that, that respect, uh, I'm, I'm all ears. Matt, uh, mm -hmm. um interested in stuff you didn't quite talk about on Mozilla 4 where you're doing the send a smile, send a frown, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you're doing some kind of affinity grouping on the feedback using Hadoop or something like, like that. And can you talk a little bit about how you're trying to process the feedback that you're getting and what's your thoughts on doing that? Yeah, it's... Right. Um, it, 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 it's kind of an, an experiment, you know, certainly for this, uh, this is the first time that we've tried that. Um, and it has been, you know, quite successful. We're getting like about 5,000 tweet or, or inputs a day. And largely I think it's, we're, uh, like I said, in, in doing clustering based, you know, in terms of phrases. We see that, uh, you know, for instance, like tab browsing, uh, that is one of the key areas that people are having problems with. Um, we also take a look at, you know, what people are saying about the, you know, just the usability experience and feeding back that into our UI team. So it's, it's kind of this constant um, monitoring, uh, you know, with the tools that we have in place in the back end. But it's, it, I, I would say that QA uses it the most at this point, um, or at least in terms of the actionable data, because that's, we are, we're, we're basing our test plans around that as well as prioritizing our test plans. But I think that, you know, over time, we're going to get a little bit more experience, you know, what we can do, you know, with this particular data. Does that answer your question, or is that, eh, yeah. sort of. Well, it's, like I said, it's, it, it is an experiment, and we're going to get better at, at u utilizing that, so. Okay. Anyway, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody.